very much, Cardinal O'Malley, and thank you for inviting me uh, to be the entertainment this evening. In these circles, I'm usually better known as the brother of my sisters, Margaret Condon and Annette Waymel, or uh, as the godfather of my nephew, Kevin Waymel, who's been ordained for the Diocese of Newark. Um, I was asked to share with you a few thoughts about marriage and the family, and it's a topic I, like many, I guess all of you, have personal experience with. I've been married for 38 years. I have, uh, with my wife, five children. Four of them are married, uh, one just last week. And they've given us 15 grandchildren, and there's at least one more on the way. I know the importance of a strong marriage, and uh, Margaret and I both know the impact that two loving parents can have on children. I also have a professional interest in marriage, as at the Catholic University of America, where I'm the president, we have nearly 4,000 undergraduates who live and study each year, and it's our job to form and educate them. The families that they come from have a tremendous impact on how well their education and formation go. Growing up in a home with a married mother and father will influence their confidence and their daily relationship, their likelihood of succeeding in school, and um, the probability that they'll wait for marriage to have children of their own. Marriage and family are important for faith, too. An interesting new book entitled How the West Really Lost God argues that the decline in religion in the West followed and was caused by the decline in the family. The bonds of marriage and child rearing help to keep people in the pews on Sunday. And when those bonds are broken, religion has a hard time sustaining itself. This effect has an impact on us as a religious university. We can provide the right resources for building a Catholic environment on campus, but much ultimately depends on what our students bring to college with them. Those who arrive with a serious faith form a necessary core that preserves the Catholic culture on campus. So families are important to me not only as a father and grandfather, but also as a teacher and a university president. That's why I'm worried that they seem to be so much in decline. Tonight I want to answer, or offer an answer, to one question that I think we should be asking about marriage. If being raised in a cohesive family, by which we mean one with a mother and a father who are married to one another, is so important for the development of children, and I'll argue that it is, why are we seeing this decline? In 2010, nearly half of first births in America were to unmarried women. Almost three-fourths of first births to women under 25 were to single women. In an age when prospective parents are bombarded, bar bar bombarded with information about healthy pregnancy and natural childbirth and raising confident, well-rounded, eco-friendly children, the failure to provide the environment that most reliably leads to thriving children is striking. The answer I'll suggest is one that my friend Mary Eberstadt calls the most unfashionable, unwanted, and ubiquitously deplored moral teaching on earth. It's a teaching I will confess to having disputed myself in times past. It was suggested 46 years ago by Paul VI in his encyclical Humani Vitae and has been taken up in more recent history by Catholic theologians and social scientists and economists. At the heart of the decline of the family is the separation of sex from children brought about by the legal and cultural embrace of contraception. Uncoupling sex from babies has changed three things. First, sex itself second, children, and third, the relationship between men and women. Though it promised to change all three for the better, though the economist called it the most important scientific advance of the 20th century, contraception has in fact led to a cheapening of sex, to difficulties in the way men and women relate to one another, and above all, harm to children. This seems almost counterintuitive, when the early advocates of contraception made the public case for its legalization, their promise was every child a wanted child. In those 
more innocent prelapsarian times, we pictured married couples wanting to bring children into the world, but doing so in a way that wouldn't jeopardize the mother's health or harm too greatly the family's finances or resources. Contraception, it was promised, would allow husbands and wives to engage in sexual activity without having to plan on the possibility of a pregnancy every time. Humani Vitae itself expressed the appeal of this vision. Here's what it said. Given the conditions of life today, and given the importance that conjugal relations have for harmony between husband and wife and for their mutual fidelity, would not a revision of ethical norms be perhaps advisable, especially when one considers that they cannot be observed without sacrifices, sometimes heroic sacrifices? But in changing pregnancy by effectively separating conception from sexual activity, we changed sex. The weighty consequences associated with the possibility of conception once made sex a really significant activity, as significant as the life that might follow from it. For that reason, sex was generally something premeditated. Most obviously, people refrained from it outside of marriage. Its physical, economic, social, and psychological dimensions were part of the consideration of sex, and having sex was not to be taken lightly. This was our social practice, enforced by notions of virtue and counsels of prudence and legal rules and social taboos. So closely were sex and marriage linked that sex was referred to as the marital act. The common law used the term marital rights to refer to a husband's right to sexual relations with his wife. In this regard, the common law was indeed sexist. A woman did not have a right to sexual relations with her husband. Contraception took what was once a single contract involving uh, and linking sex to marriage and babies and made it into three separate contracts. Sex is one thing, having babies is another, and making a lifelong commitment is still a third. Whereas a sexual union once implied a commitment not only to a possible baby, but also to one's partner as the mother or father of the child, Contraceptive sex carries no such commitment. All that's implied is a shared pleasurable experience for as long as one's partner wants it. If a baby does enter this picture, it has nothing to do with the sex. It's the subject of an entirely new and separate agreement, one about parenthood and possibly, but not necessarily, a relationship between partners. Sex is now about two people, not three. At the same time, contraceptive sex changed how those two people related to one another. Old-fashioned sex required one to think about the other as a procreator, that is to say, as a potential mother or father. Contraceptive sex removed that obligation. If sex is the only thing on the table, one need not consider the wider context of the relationship, the emotional, intellectual, spiritual, moral compatibility of one's partner, her financial and social situation, one's own ability to make a serious commitment of time and energy and love. The other party only needs to be seen as sexually desirable for this union, if that's not too enduring a word for what's often a one-night stand. This has some social and moral implications I'll say more about. My point here is just that by changing sex, we fundamentally altered the way men and women relate to one another in romantic and sexual relationships. This is really important, given how essential those relationships are to the health and structure of individuals and communities and society. So let me turn now to how separating sex from children has affected children first and parents and everyone else around them second. So let me begin with the children. The new sexual contract has had a profound impact on the way we view children. The alluring promise of early contraception advocates to make every child a wanted child was that sex on these terms would create a more supportive environment for child rearing. Margaret Sanger's campaign was as much about the well-being of children as it was about the liberation of women. A wanted child was more likely to be nurtured and supported and provided for in all her social and financial and emotional and physical needs than an unwanted one. As things turned out, contraception had the opposite effect. 
If by a supportive, nurturing environment, we mean a stable family with a mother and a father, the widespread use of contraception has been counterproductive. To quote Mary Eberstadt once more, the pill and its associated movement, the sexual revolution, contributed to the weakening of family bonds as no other single technological force in history. More children are being born into unstable families. According to recent data from the National Center for Health Statistics, the percentage of all births to unmarried women has risen from 18% in 1980 to 41% in 2011. To understand why, we have to think again about what happens when sex is separated from the commitments associated with children. Children were once seen as the fruit of a relationship, and the relationship was characterized by one specific activity, sex. If you were going to have sex, you had to be prepared to welcome a child. And the best way to do that was to enter into a committed, lifelong relationship. The relationship and the sex and the child all went together. When contraception uncoupled sex from both the relationship of people bound to one another and from the creation of children, it made children extraneous to sex. If a baby resulted from failed contraception, it was a mistake rather than a natural expectation. At the same time, contraception encouraged the expectation that sex of any kind, uncontracepted sex, and even on a certain view, sex within marriage, should not create an expectation of an enduring commitment. It's not hard to see how this new way of approaching sex quickly became linked to a rise in single parenthood. With contraception as a way of life, sex is a recreational activity that carries no expectation of lifelong commitment to one's partner or to raising a child. The commitment question arises only after a child is conceived. And since committing to marriage and child rearing is more work and less fun than sex, it's hardly surprising that men walk away, leaving mothers to raise children alone or with the government's help. George Akerlof explored the unexpected relationship between contraception and single parenthood in an important paper in the mid-1990s. Akerlof observed a curious phenomenon at the beginning of his paper. Out of wedlock births nearly doubled among African Americans in the United States between 1965 and 1990, and more than quintupled among whites during the same period. The finding is counterintuitive when you recall that this is precisely the period when contraception gained wider acceptance and legality and abortion became legal. Ikerlof also noted a drop off in another social phenomenon, so-called shotgun marriages. For whites, the shotgun marriage ratio began to decline at almost the same time as the advent, advent of female contraception for unmarried women and the legalization of abortion. So contraception did not change the fact of unwanted pregnancies but it did change how we dealt with them. It eliminated the expectation that pregnancy meant a marriage would follow. The effects of singleton parenting are bleak. We know, for instance, that children raised by a mother and a father who are married to one another are better positioned to succeed than those who are not. Children reared in intact homes are more successful academically and more healthy emotionally they have better familial and sexual development, and they're less likely to end up in jail. They're more likely to report high self-esteem and less likely to wind up pregnant as teenagers. They're also less likely to be abused or neglected. The new arrangements that contraception has given rise to, single mothers, single fathers, mothers with living boyfriends, fathers with living girlfriends, all far short of the stable and nurturing environment that married couples provide for children. Biological fathers are more involved and affectionate with their children than cohabiting partners are. Social science confirms a conclusion drawn by nearly every civilization in recorded history. Children do best with a mother and a father who are committed to one another and to raising their children. In these arrangements, the big losers are not the men and women seeking their bliss, but the children born into an unstable environment. 
contraception promised to raise the standard of living for children to make every child a wanted child, but it didn't. More unwanted children are born on account of it, and those who are wanted are often born into homes without the two parents they need. So that's how it is with the children. Let me say something now about the parents, because at the same time, contraception does not seem to have delivered the goods to women that it promised. Women were supposed to be, along with wanted children, the lucky beneficiaries of contraception. It promised them more control over their bodies and therefore more freedom of choice about the circumstances in which they would have children. This greater freedom was supposed to help them prevent pregnancies that would leave them overtaxed financially or emotionally constrained, forced to raise a child in poverty, forced to compromise that child's upbringing, and so on. It's a great and sad irony that contraception did not do these things for women. By changing the terms of the sex contract, contraception left women who got pregnant more vulnerable than they once were. Contraception effectively moved most of the responsibility for a child from those who engage in sex to those who get pregnant. And since those who get pregnant tend to be women, it's they who are disproportionately hurt by the shift. Once sex is untied from babies, responsibility for babies is unlinked from sex. The question of what to do with the baby, abort it, put it up for adoption, raise it, is now the woman's exclusive choice and her exclusive responsibility. In 2012, 24% of children were living only with their mothers, while only about 4% of children were living only with their father. Though it supposedly gave women more choices with regard to sex and children, contraception canceled the expectation that fathers would be responsible for an equal share in raising them. Women can choose to mother babies they conceive, but they have a hard time requiring fathers, with whom they're only casually acquainted, to do their part. As a result, many more women find themselves pregnant without the support needed to raise a child. I said a moment ago that the life prospects of children raised by a single parent, usually a mother, are diminished. But it's important to see that the new arrangements hurt women and men too. Separating sexual activity from children and from the promise of a monogamous commitment has changed us. Commitments are character forming. Both the commitment to a marriage and the commitment to parenthood have an important effect on becoming full-blown adults. Cultures throughout history have celebrated those who have the courage and maturity to take on the responsibilities of marriage and children. They recognize the implications of these commitments for citizenship and membership in a religious community, for building healthy societies, and for forming people in virtue. The separation of sex, commitment, and babies has compromised this important step in character development. Sex is still considered a rite of passage, but it's separate from the morally challenging commitments that gave it real significance. As a result, young people develop different moral habits around sex, and these habits make the commitment to lifelong marriage more difficult. Even people interested in marriage and children in the long run, and most people still are, now think that they can have casual sex for a decade or two without serious repercussions. This is a naive moral view. It ignores the effects that habits, good and bad, have on our patterns of behavior. Habitual casual sex makes a person good at casual sex. It doesn't prepare him or her for the kind of monogamous, self-giving relationship required of a parent and spouse. Likewise, the discipline required to wait for sex until marriage is good preparation for the discipline required of to remain faithful in a marriage. The honoring of potential children expressed by avoiding sex and the risk of pregnancy before marriage forms habits associated with being a good parent. Dispensing with the important moral growth that used to be associated with sex helps to explain two phenomena. The first, and the most obvious, is the prevalence of infidelity and divorce. When sex and commitment and children are habitually separated, it's hard to put them back together again we become accustomed to thinking of our sex lives as only accidentally related to commitment and children. 
to use the language of contracts again, we find it plausible to cancel our contracts on sex and commitment without canceling our contract on raising children. This is, at least in part, because contraception has taught us to view sex as separate from responsibility to other people. The second effect is on dating and selecting a spouse. When sex and babies are con connected, dating is a process of looking for a partner who exhibits the virtues of a good spouse and parent. One asks whether a partner will be a good provider, whether he has good character, whether he's capable of making a lifelong commitment. When sex and children are separate, the qualities sought in a sex partner tend to be more superficial. Good sex doesn't require good character or lifelong fidelity. Lucretius famously argued that people enjoyed sex more if it was uncomplicated by any romantic attraction. Over time, the qualities that we develop a taste for in a contraceptive culture are not those we associate with lasting love. There tends to be a heightened emphasis on physical attributes and on fleeting emotional satisfaction. For many people in their 20s and 30s, finding a significant other or even just a Friday night date means spending time at the gym or the spa, not becoming more interesting or morally good. The upshot is a sexual culture stuck in a perpetual adolescence that never matures into the kind of sexual culture that can support families and future generations. There is a film in 2007 called Juno that some of you may have seen and that illustrates this point nicely. It tells the story of Juno McGuff, a quirky teenager who gets pregnant in high school and decides to keep the, uh, keep the, uh, to find a family for the baby rather than to abort it. Mark and Vanessa Loring seem to be the perfect upper middle class couple eager to adopt her child. They can't have biological children, we learn, and Vanessa is dying to be a mother. But as the baby's birth draws near, Mark starts to back out. After a fight with his wife, he explains to her, I never promised I'd be a good father. In the end, Mark bails, not only on the baby, but also on their marriage, and Vanessa's left to raise the child alone. The tragedy of contraception is not just that it increases the Junos in the world, it also increases the Marks. So let me conclude with a few thoughts on what all this means for Catholics. The first is about surviving this culture. I've tried to make the case that contraception pulls apart three things that ought to go together, sex and commitment and children, and that this is harmful for sustaining healthy families. It's the message about sex that Catholics have heard for two millennia. Paul VI affirmed it in Humani Vitae, but it's a message that has little traction in recent decades. The reality is that Catholics today who choose not to contracept will find themselves in the minority even within their own church. This makes it harder, especially on the generations of Catholics who've grown up accustomed not only to contraception, but to its many bad consequences, single parent homes, cohabiting parents, abortion in the morning after pill, the prevalence of casual premarital sex, and the change in attitude toward sex and relationships and children that I have been describing. Catholics who want to raise children, who one day will grow up to be good parents, have to be aware of how saturated the culture is with these attitudes about sex and to counteract them with a better message. But it's not enough for Catholics to circle the wagons and protect their own. Our faith requires us to try to persuade others of the truth. And we have a special responsibility to protect and care for children. An optimist might hope that future generations will see what a mess we've made of things and try to put sex and children back together. I hope so. One step in that direction would be reaching young people with this message before they get hypnotized by the broader sexual culture. We try to do this in our churches and schools, sometimes by advocating for political policies. But the best way to change the sexual culture is through the example of having families. As long as it's just a message about sex and one with less immediate appeal to young people than its rival view, it won't have much force. When the message is embodied by families who model the love and support and generosity that marriage and children bring to a sexual relationship, as well as the importance of saving sex for marriage, the message is harder to ignore. Having families like that 
and supporting those families in our churches and communities is, I think, our best hope for bringing sex and commitment and children back together. I hope we can do that. Thanks for listening to me.